Welcome to r slash pro revenge where OP's wife cheats on him with 13 different guys. So he gets his revenge. Back in 2018, I had a temporary internship in California at a large tech company. So I took a recommendation from a friend about a room for rent. I'd be living with five other people, but otherwise, it looked fantastic with spacious common areas, multiple huge TVs, full amenities, community rec center with pool, short drive times to multiple places of interest, all for 650 bucks a month, utilities included. I contacted my landlord, whom I will refer to as Sucky Landlord. He seemed fine on the phone, so I sent him my security deposit to move in a month later. When it came time to move in, I discover a few caveats that came with this low rent price. The common areas were all dusty. None of the three large TVs worked properly. If we wanted access to the rec center and pool, we need to pay $80 a month in a membership fee. And all of the short drive time estimates were exaggerated, unless you were speeding at two times the speed limit. Whatever, it's not the end of the world, especially at the relatively low price. I'll survive. But then it got worse in the coming months. Sucky landlord decided to charge us an extra 20 bucks a month for paper towels and public cleaning supplies. Also, sucky landlord only checked the community mailbox once a week when he was in town and refused to trust anybody with the mailbox key. As it starts to roll into summer, in June, sucky landlord decided that AC cost too much and we were using too much, so he removed the thermostat from the wall. Um, okay. One day, some of us tenants confronted him when he was at the house, since Sucky Landlord also slept at the house about one day a week. And I'll never forget his words as he rushed out of the house. It's legal for me to do it and I don't care since I don't have to live here. Well sir, F you. I'm tilted as anything at this guy's obvious money grab from six tenants. Well, it turns out he's right, he legally doesn't need to provide air conditioning. So the next day, I purchase a high BTU freestanding portable air conditioner that exhausts out the window. Holy cow, this thing was a luxury. Of course, I pump my room to 65 degrees Fahrenheit, the lowest setting. We have a couple other minor disagreements that wind up with sucky landlord texting me that it's fine if I wanted to break my lease and move out early. Perfect. When sucky landlord finally gets a whiff of my AC setup, he comes to my room to complain about my AC unit. I reply curtly. It's legal for me to do it, and I don't care since I don't have to pay for electricity. He leaves and later sends me a text. And OP includes a screenshot of the text which I'll read now. OP, about the AC unit you have in your room. If you choose to run the AC in your room at 50 degrees because your computer generates so much heat, then that's your choice. But you'll need to pay an additional $100 per month for the additional electricity you've been spending. And that's going from the time you installed it in the room without my permission. Thank you much. The electricity bill more than doubled since last month, with the temperatures being very close to the same. And OP replies, I'm willing to cease usage of my portable AC unit on the condition that the temperature of the house be set to 72 degrees Fahrenheit. Regardless, I'm under no obligation to pay your completely arbitrary and baseless demand of $100 per month, and nor must I remove the unit from my room per your demands. You can request, but not demand that I pay for a portion of any utility bill, regardless of your opinions. I don't appreciate it when you knowingly try to overstep your authority as a landlord and demand compliance to arbitrary policies that you have completely imagined out of thin air. I am very disappointed in you. And now back to the story. Unbeknownst to Sucky Landlord, I'm taking his move out offer seriously and this whole time I've been rallying the troops. All the tenants have been upset about everyone's living situation, so with some minor encouragement, I managed to convince two of the other six tenants to move out at the same time as me. They were on a month to month arrangement. I finally submit all of our notices of intent to vacate at the same time, barely a week after my previous conversation with Sucky Landlord. He's pissed. He was just trying to get me out of the house, but now he has three rooms to fill instead of just one. I ask about my legally mandated pre-move out inspection. In no uncertain terms, he told me to go F myself. He told me he's too busy to perform an inspection. Hmm, well that's illegal, but okay. Time comes to move out. I found another room for rent much closer to the office for only a hundred bucks more. We all move out and I text sucky landlord about my security deposit. No response. I text again. No response. Okay, I see where this is going. 
I spend days and days reading the law, compiling evidence and screenshots, and listing the laws that were broken. The smoking gun was a statute that requires a pre-move-out inspection and a list of things to fix, and an itemized list of deductions within 21 days, or else Sucky Landlord loses the right to withhold any of my deposit. In addition, he would be subject to treble damages if he's found to be acting in bad faith. I text again and again. I give him plenty of leniency, and I even cite the law so I can prove in court that I'm acting in good faith. And Sucky Landlord intentionally ignored the laws that I made him aware of. Sucky Landlord probably thinks that I'm a young, pushover college student who won't follow through with legal threats. Well, sir, we're going to court because I'm petty as anything when it comes to people trying to screw me over. I file in small claims for 650 bucks plus treble damages, plus court costs. Sucky Landlord files a counterclaim of $2,000 for damages to the property, claiming I caused flooding and I broke the microwave. Okay, buddy. In response, I gather testimonies from three of the other tenants and I build my case into a 40-page packet of evidence, complete with page numbers, a table of contents, and descriptions for every screenshot and photo. I make three copies of everything and submit it to the court and the defendant, Sucky Landlord. He starts filing requests to postpone the trial. He cites a doctor's appointment and the motion is granted. The court date is rescheduled for a month later in December, but still before I fly home. The new court date approaches and he files another request to postpone, citing another doctor's appointment. Somehow, that motion is granted as well and we're rescheduled yet again to January. Darn. January rolls around and surprise, surprise, guess who's got another doctor's appointment conveniently on the exact same day of the trial? Denied. The court finally got off his BS and denied the motion because he can't prove he scheduled the doctor's appointment prior to the court date being moved. Welp, I'm not in California anymore. I'm across the country on the East Coast. Sucky Landlord thinks that if I'm no longer in the state, he'll automatically win since I'm not willing to fly back to California. Well, unbeknownst to Sucky Landlord, California courts offer an option to appear by telephone. <laughs> court day comes and I get the call. I'm sworn in and then connected to the court. I'm given time to present my case. Unfortunately, I didn't prepare a script, so I kinda summarize the event and explain why I deserve the money. Then, Sucky Landlord gets time to defend himself and explain his counterclaim. He hasn't prepared anything either, and he ends up rambling about random stuff that doesn't help his case at all. For example, he spends a lot of time explaining how another one of his tenants was sucky and so his behavior was justified. He doesn't even have a sliver of evidence for his counterclaim when the judge asks for it. The judge asks a few more questions and announces that he'll review the evidence and will get the decision in the mail. A couple weeks later, I get the judgment saying I'm owed 650 bucks. Sucky landlord gets nothing. Well, darn, no treble damages for me. However, it's just my luck the sucky landlord is a piece of garbage and won't accept defeat. He files an appeal for who knows what. It's granted. Redo trial is scheduled for May. This time, I'm 10 times more prepared. Once again, I'm sworn in and then they connect me to the courtroom speaker. This time, I have a hashed out script that I read, making sure to emphasize how often I inform Sucky Landlord of the law, how often Sucky Landlord knowingly broke the law, and how I offered so much leniency, and so many opportunities to do the right thing. Once again, Sucky Landlord doesn't prepare anything, but instead rambles on so much that even the judge tells him to get back on track multiple times. Sucky Landlord claims I caused water damage and had to replace all the carpets. The judge asks for an invoice or receipt. He has none. Sucky Landlord claims I broke the microwave, so the judge reads him the three witness statements that all state I didn't break the microwave. Sucky Landlord says they're all lying. He still has no evidence whatsoever. At this point, the judge clearly sounds done with his garbage and says we'll get his decision in the mail and the call ends. A couple of weeks later, I get the judgment. I'm owed $1,800 and Sucky Landlord still gets nothing. Well, dang, would you look at that. His appeal didn't quite work out for him. He goes from owing me $650 to owing me $1,800. Being the douchebag that he is, he files for a mistrial claiming I was not sworn in and that I lied in testimony. Denied. Outside of court, Sucky Landlord offers a payment plan of 20 bucks a month, which will take seven and a half years to pay back, or otherwise he refuses to pay up. 
Okay, I see how collecting my money is going to be. I figure out he bangs at Bank of America by looking up the checks I gave him for rent and seeing where they got cashed. I file for a writ of execution that will allow me to perform a bank levy. It's granted, so I prepare a packet for the L.A. County Sheriff's Department to go to the Bank of America and take his money. The L.A. Sheriff's Department serves him with papers and orders Bank of America to freeze his account. After his allotted time of 30 days to contest the seizure, the sheriff sees his money, plus 10% APY interest, plus sheriff's fees. I finally get the glorious check in the mail, 20 months after moving out. I'll probably frame it. Total, $1,893.91. I feel like every single person on planet Earth has a sucky landlord or a boss or an old teacher that they would just love to stick it to. Congrats, OP. That $1,800 revenge is well earned. Our next Reddit post is from Deleted. I divorced my ex-wife over five years ago for repeatedly cheating on me with over 13 different men and two women. To give you some background, my ex and I used to be swingers until the last year of our marriage. Things had spiraled out of control, so I said that I was done swapping partners. Unfortunately, she didn't agree with me and kept hooking up with guys behind my back. Six months prior to our divorce, my oldest child was diagnosed with a life-threatening illness. I won't go into details to preserve my anonymity. She started to crack under the pressure and started to drink a lot, putting herself and our children in danger. It got so bad that I moved out of the house for a couple of weeks and took our kids with me. During this time, her best friend, we'll call her Amy, approached me because my ex had disclosed all of her dirty deeds at her girls' night out a couple of days ago. She disclosed that she had been sleeping with a new guy every night and getting drunk when she had the kids. She also told Amy that she went out one night a month ago and left our 3-year-old and 4-year-old kids at home alone while they slept so she could meet a guy. Amy said that my ex planned on filing for divorce once she drained some additional money from me while living rent-free in my home. Amy and I were both disgusted and knew that things had to come to an end. My ex hated living in the same house with me because she hated me and couldn't go mess around with her flock of desperate men. We had to come up with a plan to get her out of the house and document all her poor behavior so we could limit her custody of the children. Step 1. I moved back into the house and plopped down on the bed right next to her. She lost her mind, saying that she wanted me out of the house now and would call the police if I didn't comply. What she didn't know was that I was recording the audio of our conversation. I told her to pound sand and she called the cops reporting me for domestic violence. Well, the popo showed up in no time flat and had me in cuffs so fast it made my head spin. The detective came to the squad car to talk to me and I let him listen to the recording. The longer he listened, the more angry he became with my wife. Before long, she was the one in cuffs in the back of the squad car and she got to spend the night in jail. Then, she went to stay with Amy for the next week as she wasn't allowed back at our house. I got a restraining order. During this week, she went on a veritable spending spree, buying herself a new laptop, new iPhone, and a new wardrobe. She drained our bank account and started to dip into my savings. Amy also confirmed that she was drinking heavily at her house, to the point that she threw up and defecated on herself all over her bathroom. Amy video recorded her bender for posterity's sake and provided me with 20 minutes of video showing a woman out of control drunk. The next day, I went and withdrew all of our money from savings and deposited them in my new bank account so I would have money to pay the bills. I closed that account so she couldn't use overdraft protection and leave me on the hook for overages. I closed all of our joint credit cards and transferred all of my investment accounts into an account solely in my name. She lost it when she found out that she had no money to burn through anymore. She told Amy that she was contemplating suicide because things had gotten so bad. I hate my ex, but I didn't want to see her harm herself at all. Amy convinced her that she needed some help and went with her to check into an inpatient mental hospital. This worked out fantastic because she was getting help, but also it showed that she was a danger to herself and the kids. It was time to put the last part of our plan into action and seal the deal. I went for a consultation at my attorney to start the divorce proceedings and complete the needed paperwork. My attorney was appalled at the actions of my ex and was 100% on board with helping me get primary custody. He filed my divorce decree and also got the judge to agree to a temporary restraining order until our initial hearing. We served her the papers while she was in the hospital and set the initial hearing for two weeks. The initial hearing came and she showed up with her attorney. 
Since it was a pre-litigation hearing, they didn't know what information we had. She got on the stand and started lying her heart out, telling the judge how abusive I was and that is what pushed her into the mental hospital. She made a very compelling case and put on a Grammy award winning act. Then it was my turn. My attorney presented all the evidence, videos, and bank records. The defining moment was when my attorney called Amy to the stand to testify. She told an appalling story about a neglectful mom who was completely out of control. A story about a mother who had substance abuse issues that were only getting worse. My ex couldn't close her mouth the whole time that Amy was on the stand. She made her attorney look like an idiot as all of her lies were now being exposed and were contrary to what she told him. When the dust settled, I was awarded sole custody and she was awarded supervised visitation until she went to rehab and got additional treatment. We quickly settled out of court, agreeing to a graduated visitation schedule once she complied with rehab and mental health counseling. I got the house, after paying her a portion of the equity. Got to keep all of my investment accounts and get to see my kids 80% of the time. She got to go live with her mom for the next two and a half years and jump from job to job. Life is pretty good five years down the road, and is even better knowing that she isn't my problem anymore. Man, Amy is the real MVP of this story. OP, I sincerely hope you bought her flowers after this, because she single-handedly stopped your ex-wife from ruining your life. That was r slash pro revenge, and if you like this video then hit that subscribe button because I put out new reddit videos every single day.